two foster parents were accepted and approved for not only running a daycare, but also to care for children within the child welfare system. Then, they would be charged with the neglect and murder of a three-year-old foster child. This boy was left behind, locked in a closet, while this family went on vacation. Yet there are many differing confessions about who did this to Marcus Fiesel and what actually happened. With one only getting 15 years and another granted immunity, was this boy really given justice? You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, and this is another case touching on just the failures of Child Protective Services. And due to CPS actually being overworked in this case in Ohio, they hired a company called Lifeway of Youth who actually had the responsibility of placing these foster children. And they placed this little boy with the parents who would end up murdering him. And we will get into who exactly between the two and the parents were held accountable and what, if anything, has changed since. I also want to thank Geology for sponsoring once again. This is a skincare lifesaver when you are transitioning into a different season. This time of year, my skin normally panics. It's flaky, it's tight, it's gross. And Geology knew exactly what I needed because if you don't know, they create a routine that's just for you. It's simple ingredients. It's effective and all you have to do is take a quiz and it comes straight to your door. The deal that they're giving you guys is absolutely incredible. You can get 70% off their award-winning skincare trial set when you use the code BrickMcKenna70 or if you want to scan the QR code on the screen. On top of that, they're giving you an additional offer of 30% off any skin, hair, and body products if you want to add it on to your trial. I use their products all the time, have been using it for months now, love it, and really appreciate them sponsoring. So let's get into the story. So it was 2006 in Ohio and a young boy would be reported missing in Claremont County. Now this was Tuesday, August 15th, and this is when there would be a call to police about a woman who had passed out at Juliffs Park. This was in Anderson Township. It was a very busy park, but around 1.15 p.m., this mother who had brought kids to the park to play had blacked out and the park staff had rushed to her aid. They called her an ambulance. And so she was rushed to the Mercy Anderson Hospital. And the staff actually cared for her children while they also called her husband to come take the kids. Now, it turned out that the woman who had passed out had been 30-year-old Liz Carroll and her husband, 29-year-old David Carroll Jr., would arrive at the scene around 140 to 145. And he was confused because there were only three children present and they had four in their care. It was explained that these four children consisted of one of their own children who was a two and a half year old child. And then they had two foster children who were a one and a half year old child and a three year old. And then they had a child they were babysitting that was one and a half years old as well. The three year old was missing and this was Marcus, one of the foster children in their care. Now Marcus was said to have a tendency to run off and he was said to be autistic. He knew a few sounds, but he was a little boy with special needs. Now, immediately after hearing this, the Julius Park was closed down and the police, fire department, and the community members rushed to help and rushed to search and an emergency command center was also set up on the grounds. Now, thankfully, this park was fenced in so it was theorized that he couldn't have gotten far, though there was a nearby busy street called Clow Pike on the other side of the fence that was quite concerning with all of the cars rushing by. But David Carroll would explain that Marcus could do anything, including climb a fence. For the next few hours and then into the night, there were hundreds of volunteers and law enforcement alike searching different areas of this park and the surrounding neighborhoods for Marcus. Helicopters were brought in and police captain Mike Hartzler theorized that Marcus had either run away from the park while his foster mother had passed out or he had been abducted. Now, surveillance footage from that area, not the exact area where the mother was found passed out, but from the park was found to see if they could see any signs of Marcus, but this didn't provide any answers. And this wasn't because Marcus wasn't seen with a stranger or wasn't seen on the tapes. It was because the machine actually malfunctioned. So all they got was this blue black screen and that showed nothing. 
Now, Marcus's photo was spread throughout the public and tips did begin to come in. One in particular was a possible sighting of Marcus or a boy who matched his description in the area getting into a car. And so as the evening turned to night, the busyness in the area settled down a bit and it was quite silent. And so all you could hear were volunteers calling out from every direction, little boy trying to get his attention. While the searchers weren't giving up, a local mother actually came and dropped off food for the volunteers, and that is when Kroger's, as well as Jersey Mike's, served food to support as well. No one was going home, and they continued to travel on foot, and then they were getting buses to go out to different areas, and this went into Wednesday morning and throughout that day as well. But by Wednesday evening, around 10 p.m., volunteers and law enforcement did start trickling out. They had been there for over 20 for hours. They needed to go home and get some sleep. And this especially started happening after the executive director of Doolittle's Park, who was Molly McClure, had left because she actually had to deal with the media. You see, they were accusing the park of losing Marcus. They hadn't come up with this theory on their own though. The reporters would go to where Liz Carroll was in the hospital and ask her what she believed happened. And she had accused the park for her son going missing. Director Molly McClure had a very sinking feeling hearing this and it wouldn't be until two weeks later that that gut feeling would be confirmed. You see, by Thursday, which was two days since the disappearance, the police then headed to the Carroll's home to grab some items that had belonged to Marcus in order to help locate him because they were bringing in the canines at that point. But the bloodhounds could not pick up the scent of Marcus anywhere at the park, though it had been two days. So this, along with the fact that there were so many people searching through the park, so many different smells, dive teams were brought in in the area as well. However, that night of Thursday, the entire search was called off. It was just until they had some credible information about his whereabouts. Now, the next day on Friday the 18th, Liz Carroll was discharged from the hospital and a $10,000 reward for information on Marcus was announced. The Carroll family then moved from their home. This was said to have already started prior to the disappearance, and then they chose to quicken the pace of this when the media got a hold of their address and were constantly coming to their home. So they decided to move out at this time, so investigators weren't really concerned. But Liz told investigators that at the park, she spoke to a silver-haired lady who saw them all, including Marcus. So there was a press release asking for any silver-haired ladies who had been at that park to come forward, but this wasn't leading anywhere either. Four days later, on August 22nd, a week since the disappearance, no leads had been found in Marcus's case, and a press conference was then led by Liz Carroll. She would plead with the public saying, I was at the park with him and three other kids, playing on swings and slides, and have low blood pressure issues. Collapsed somehow, sometime, Marcus wandered off or was taken. I believe someone did take him, hopefully with good intentions. Liz then went on to say that her husband wasn't there at the press conference because he was watching the other kids, but that he had undergone a polygraph test and he had failed it. Though she said it wasn't accurate because they didn't do anything. Now, Liz was wearing the same clothes that she had worn on the day Marcus went missing in case it helped someone to remember them from that day. But she finished her statement with, I need help from the public to help my son. Marcus is my son. I know people think foster care is temporary, but please return him to a hospital. Waking up every morning and not having him run to me is very difficult. I'm closer than his birth mother to him. But the suspicious thing was, no matter how many witnesses from that day at the park were spoken to, no one could remember Marcus. Police told the public that Liz Carroll had been working with them. She was speaking to them. She was helping. She described every adult she had seen in the park that day, and she said he was 100% at the park. She also claimed that one of his caseworkers from CPS saw Marcus five days prior to his disappearance. Now, while investigators were just now announcing this to the public, they had already started investigating into the Ohio's Child Protective Services because they had started using a service called the Lifeway of Youth to place those foster children. 
You see, Marcus Fiesel was born on June 24th of 2003 in Middleton, Ohio, and he had a developmental disability and needed about 24-hour care and attention. Now, his mother was Donna Trevino, who had two children prior to Marcus, who were Michael and Peaches. The father wasn't in the picture. However, Donna did have a boyfriend at the time of Marcus's birth, and the boyfriend was known to abuse Donna, and the police were often called to their home. And during one of these visits, the police noticed that the home was a mess. It was filled with fleas and smelling of feces. Now, nothing was done about the state of the home and, you know, checking in on these children. However, when the police were continued to be called back after the boyfriend's abuse persisted, that is when they got concerned. You see, on September 29th of 2005, child welfare workers began to receive complaints about this family in regards to the safety of the children. You see, police during one of these visits had seen severe bruising on the youngest, Marcus's bottom, and had reported this. And all, although the investigation began at this time, it actually wasn't until 2006 when Marcus was three years old that any action would be taken. You see, in January of 2006, Marcus had to be taken to the doctor where he received stitches after he had crawled out of the second story window and fallen. He had a cut on his chin, but thankfully, other than that, he appeared to be healthy. However, three months later in April, police were called because he was seen just walking around on the roads and was almost hit by a car. Police came, they took him back to his mother, and that is when they asked his mother why he was roaming alone, and Donna would admit that she didn't know if she could care for her children anymore because it was too much for her. She then gave up the custody, at least temporarily, to Child Protective Services in Butler County. Now, after her children were taken away, a neighbor of Donna's said that Donna had quite a bit of trouble taking care of Marcus specifically and was often weeping due to the exhaustion of the 24-hour care, the amount of attention he needed. It wasn't Marcus's fault, but he did require quite a lot of supervision. You see, Marcus was said to be autistic and hyperactive, and he was known to be an awesome little guy too. He loved bubbles, flowers, lights, water, Bob the Builder, but he also liked to hide and he had a tendency to run off. But when Child Protective Services had custody, and then they gave the rights to the Lifeway of Youth to place him in a home. These homes were trained by Lifeway themselves. And this is how Marcus was placed with the Carols because the Carols had become trained through Lifeway of Youth. And Liz had been this homecoming queen, a very normal girl. She was a married housewife to David at this time. They had three children together. They did daycare for other families. And then they had begun fostering, which isn't usually usually an easy acceptance into this fostering world unless CPS isn't doing their job in the application process. And it turned out Ohio wasn't because they were just offloading this work onto another company. Because the Carols were approved even though they had a third adult in the home that was not disclosed of at this time. And they also didn't realize or didn't report that David had bipolar disorder, which would have denied them as foster parents. David had also been arrested on a domestic violence charge while being a foster parent. This was just two months before Marcus vanished, and Lifeway of Youth was supposed to be notified to document this. However, he did not tell them, and nothing was looked into as far as their criminal records. But it was said that the Carols would sometimes have eight to ten kids between daycare and foster care within their home at a time. So as soon as police heard that this caseworker had been the last one to allegedly see Marcus alive besides his foster family, they located this person. And this caseworker would tell police that they didn't actually get to see Marcus that day, even though they had gone for a visit because they were told that he was sick by the foster parents and turned away. But Marcus wasn't the only one struggling at the hands of Lifeway of Youth. His siblings, Michael and Peaches, who were also taken from the home, had been put into a different foster family. But they didn't stay long at that home because the foster father that they were with received a DUI while they were in the car. After hearing this, a review of the cases handled by Lifeway for Youth began. So the Claremont County where Marcus had been placed, Butler County where his siblings had been placed, as well as Hamilton and Warren counties began removing the foster children who were placed by Lifeway and into Lifeway trained 
foster families, and they stopped all placements through this company. Ohio Child Protective Services, who had hired Lifeway of Youth, then began to place the blame entirely on them. But due to this missing boy, the Ohio CPS were finally making changes that were desperately needed, but only due to the media storm that Marcus's disappearance had caused. Because no one cared what Lifeway of Youth was doing or not doing to the children in the system who had no one advocating for them, and now they had to care because the public was demanding it because one of them was gone. The sheriff began to doubt that he was still alive, especially due to Butler County having a history of deaths of children. You see, this included a two-year-old Christopher Long who died in 2001 after a daycare provider refused to report the signs of abuse and he was then beat to death by his mother's boyfriend. And then in 2002, a three-year-old named Courtney Sinters was also beaten to death by her mother's boyfriend. And she had 43 bruises and died of internal bleeding. And her killer simply said his temper got out of hand. It didn't seem like anyone in this area from professionals to just motherly figures to the families that they were with were caring for any of these children. And the Carols were said to be paid around $2,500 a month for the daycare and around $1,000 a month for Marcus. And no special requirements were actually expected of the foster parents that Marcus was going to have, even though he was known to have special needs and require 24-hour care. But this is actually something that is quite common in CPS all over the world because they are known to misdiagnose or completely cover up a foster child's mental health records or just medical records in general in order to place them in a home as soon as possible to get that money without looking to make sure that they can give them proper care or are willing to learn how to do that proper care. But while there were no more tips coming in, prosecutor Joe Dieters actually brought the next tip to investigators because while talking to possible witnesses, he learned of the family reunion that the Carols had attended 11 days prior to the park disappearance. And Marcus hadn't been with his family at this reunion. It had already been confirmed by the caseworker that they hadn't actually seen him between the time of the reunion in the park. So it was believed that something could have happened to him 11 days prior to the park on August 4th or even earlier. So even though they didn't have the full story of this and nobody was talking with this theory 13 days since the park disappearance on August 28th, prosecutor Dieters served Liz, David, and a woman named Amy Baker subpoenas to appear in front of the grand jury. But with a lawyer, the police took this Amy Baker into a room and asked her what happened to Marcus. You see, she was living in the home at the time and she began explaining exactly what Liz and David had said to the police before that he had gone missing at the park. But then she was told if she said that to the grand jury and she was lying, she would go to prison. And so she asked to speak to her lawyer alone and an hour and a half later, she was ready to talk. Amy Baker was described as David's live-in girlfriend, even though David and Liz were married, but Amy would claim that on August 4th, before they went to that reunion, Marcus had been placed in the closet at their home, bound in a blanket and packing tape and left without food and water. That they didn't want to take him to the reunion, and so they left him there, but they heard him screaming before they left. And that David had second thoughts about wanting to go home, but when they returned, he was already dead. She then admitted to helping David dispose of his body in the Ohio River. Now, Amy Baker told this exact story to the grand jury. Do you have children, ma'am? Yes. And what are their names and ages? Taylor, Brian, and Courtney. Um, Taylor is seven and a half. Courtney is four, and Brian is six. Are you married? Yes. In your husband's name? Brian Baker. When were you married? April 12th of 01. And you are still married today? Yes. Have you been separated? Yes. For approximately how long? Three and a half years. Have there been times during that three and a half years where there were attempts to reconcile with your husband? Yes. Did you in fact move back in with your husband on a number of times during the, the past four years? Um, twice. But as of today, you are still married to him? Yes. Are your three children, is he the biological father of your three children? Yes. Do you currently have uh, physical control custody of your children? No. Who does? Children's services. 
And can you tell us when they were taken from you? The 29th of August. Of last year, 2006? Yes. And could you tell us why? I was, um, they said I was homeless and jobless. And I subject my kids to domestic violence. And um, I knew about the disappearance of Marcus. Now, when you say subjected them to domestic violence, where did that alleged domestic violence take place? At Dave and Liz's house. Did it involve you? No. Now, when did you first meet Liz and David Carroll? Um, 2005, when they started babysitting my kids. Did Dave begin to make comments to you which, uh, in, in a sense, ambiguously, uh, were suggestive? Yes. And could you give us examples of the type of comments you're talking about? Do you want to stay all night? Um, just sexual comments. And then Liz Carroll was brought in to testify. Now Liz kept claiming that he was kidnapped at the park, but when she was told that they knew that he hadn't gone to that family reunion 11 days prior, Liz admitted that on August 4th, right before they went, she had actually gone to run some errands. And when she got home, David told her that Marcus was dead and she panicked and began to call 911 and that is when Liz said that Amy actually pushed her, threatened her and said that if she called the police or if she told them what actually happened, she would kill her and her kids. Liz then allegedly was told by David that he and Amy wanted to have sex and so he put the kids outside but Amy said she would put Marcus down for a nap and he didn't know what that actually meant because they had really put Marcus in a closet and a playpen wrapped in this blanket where he could not get out and that is when they left. She said they returned two days later and for the next few days, the three of them, Liz, David, and Amy, began to come up with the alibi while David and Amy disposed of his body. But Liz said that they actually burned his body. They incinerated him. And so with these two conflicting statements on what happened to his body, detectives actually went searching for a possible location where his body had been burnt or if there were remains found in the Ohio River. And that is when they were led by Amy Baker to an abandoned farmhouse in Brown County, which was about 40 minutes away from where they lived. This farm was about 88 acres owned by a man named Mike Callis. Now he was said to not be involved in this, but at the farm there was abandoned home where there was this chimney. That is when investigators did some forensic research and they found pieces of Marcus's clothing as well as bone fragments and they confirmed it was from Marcus. And though most of his body was incinerated in this brick fireplace, they had taken multiple trips in order to do so and the rest of his body was then thrown into the river. But the coroner found that this closet that Marcus had been locked in was between 105 to 115 degrees that day and it was believed that Marcus had died from that heat. The Hamilton County Grand Jury indicted David and Liz on two counts of child endangerment and one count of involuntary manslaughter as well as making false alarms and inducing panic in the public. David was also charged with one count of gross abuse of a corpse and they were both given a $10.1 million bond. Family and friends came forward to say that David never liked Marcus because he was always jealous that Marcus got all of the attention from Liz because he needed that. It was said that David actually left Liz for a while due to this, but came back, and when he came back, he wasn't alone. He brought his new girlfriend, Amy. Now, during the trial, prosecutor Woody Pryor held up a small cup that was all of the remains that were left of Marcus Fiesel. And on February 21st, 2007, Liz Carroll pled not guilty, saying that Marcus's death was an accident. She played no contest to perjury and she apologized for the lies that led to the search saying she was trying to protect her family and she insisted that she would never hurt a child. Her defense wanted her grand jury testimony to be thrown out due to her serious mental defects and this was granted. But the prosecutor said that you wouldn't treat a dog the way that you treated Marcus and that Liz wouldn't either because they had actually taken their dog with them and left Marcus in that closet. 
And that is when Liz spoke up in the court and said, the dog was alive. She also said that Amy Baker did not speak the truth. Her jury was made up of nine women and four men who found her guilty, and she was sentenced to 54 years to life in prison. Though an appeal was promised because a juror had allegedly said that she knew in her heart that Liz was guilty. But Liz's mother actually exploded in the courtroom hearing her daughter's sentence. My daughter, it was her life. It was my child. It was Amy that did it. But that same month, David Carroll actually pled guilty to murder because he had taken the plea deal that was offered to both Liz and David, which she had turned down, and then he was only sentenced to 15 years to life. He said that Amy had bound Marcus that day, but that he was there. And this is when Amy was actually granted immunity in Ohio for testifying against them and confessing. However, she did face extradition to Kentucky where she had been charged for tampering with evidence for disposing Marcus's body in the Ohio River. But these charges against her were actually dropped in 2008 and she never went to jail for any of this. Now, the Lifeway of Youth, responsible for the foster placement of Marcus and many others, has officially had its license revoked. Ohio also has allegedly began using the criminal justice information system to alert CPS if a foster parent is criminally charged, which could have saved Marcus's life if that is something that had been occurring at the time of his death. But we see in these cases that small changes like this will occur and it's wonderful, but then similar cases continue to pop up over and over again and it's just, it never seems to be enough. And this also wasn't the end of Lifeway for Youth. You see, they might have been run out of Ohio, but they were found to continue business in other states. In 2009, only three years since Marcus's death, the company was under the new name Benchmark Family Services. In 2013 in Texas, a foster child who required 24-hour supervision who was in Benchmark Family Services care drowned in their foster family's pool while they weren't watching. Lifeway for Youth defended their license after that, but it was also found that in Indiana, they were placed on probation for four months for not getting a foster baby treatment for gangrene. Georgia also fined Lifeway for violations seven different times. And by 2014, the company was said to receive $35 million a year and is responsible for at least 2,500 children. Now, I found what is believed to be their website that claims that they are a network of professional therapeutic foster homes and committed staff with the goal of providing stable out-of-home placements for children in need. They appear to still be in business today. And as far as Marcus's caseworker at the time of his murder, Joseph Bomer, he had actually been cleared for any negligence or wrongdoing at all. However, he said that it did really affect him and how he did his job. Marcus wasn't, wasn't able to speak. He was nonverbal at the time of his death. And therefore, I kind of feel like my voice needs to be the one that is going to make a difference in the lives of a lot of kids. David Carroll actually came forward in an interview in prison, standing up for Liz, saying that she was completely innocent. Uh, Amy and I, uh, we wanted to have sex, got, you know, got greedy. Uh, Amy said, you know, take the kids outside, we'll put Marcus down for a nap. Uh, she was supposedly supposed to be putting Marcus down for a nap. Uh, we found out later on that my wife and I, when we found Marcus later on, that she wasn't actually putting him down for a nap. She taped him up and she in a blanket and um, he died. So I ran downstairs and I told my wife, I was like, he's dead, he's dead. She was like, who's dead? And she was like, she was smiling at me because she didn't know, she, she thought I was kidding. And then after she seen my face was white, you know, she was like, she started freaking out and crying. I was like, what? She ran upstairs behind me. As soon as she turned the corner, she seen him. And she dropped her knees and she looked at me and she said, what did you do? Like blaming me. I said, I didn't do this. I said, she did it. Talking to Amy and Amy was like, I just forgot about him. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. My wife immediately goes to grab the phone. Amy grabs the phone. She's like, no, no, we can't. She's like, we can't call the cops. We can't call the cops. And Liz's like, well, I'm calling ambulance. I'm calling the ambulance. Amy's going, no, he's already dead. It's not going to do any good to call the cops, the ambulance, or anything else, whatever. Amy started pushing her and grabbed the phone out of her hand. She started saying, uh, you've seen what happened to Marcus. That can happen to your kids, too, if anything, if anything like this gets out. I, I honestly believe it was an accident. I believe that it was an accident that she'd done that. You know, I don't think she did it on purpose. I think that she just was in, you know, just made a stupid, stupid, stupid mistake. But, you know, it's, it, still don't, it still don't negate the fact that she needs to, to fess up to her to responsibilities, take responsibility for what she's done. I apologize to all the public that, that helped in, this, in the search, and, and uh, I'm very sorry for 
you know, every bit of my actions. Um, I apologize. That's, that's what I want to say. Now, while in prison, the Carrolls did remain married, and Liz Carroll would speak out for the first time from prison in 2012. Liz claimed that Amy had went back home after Liz and David were arrested and then took a whole bunch of their stuff, including her clothes, which Amy wore to the trial, and that she and Amy were never girlfriends, that that was David's girlfriend, and she had nothing to do with it. David was having an affair. Though she said she was urged by David to have sexual relations with them, Liz said that Amy was responsible here and that Amy had actually been incarcerated while she was in prison for drug possession. She had gone to the same prison that Liz was in. Liz believes that Amy is a liar and the one responsible for the death. And she believes that justice was never given because the real killer wasn't charged. Briar does not have a problem presenting lies or lying himself. Briar also said that Amy Baker passed the lie detector test and didn't harm Marcus, and I know that's 100% not possible. Now, Liz was telling the truth about Amy being in prison with her at one point because Amy had been charged with drug trafficking in 2010 and was sentenced to two years for selling prescription pills to a police informant, and she was sent to the same prison as Liz. And she now goes by her maiden name, which is Amy Ramsey. Now, by 2016, the new Butler County Child Services Director, William Morrison, said that due to the changes that they have made, that no other children have died in their care since Marcus. They said they regularly do background checks now on foster parents and monitor any criminal activity. Do you think this is enough? Because a woman named Holly Schlack, who worked in CPS in Ohio, said that it wasn't and she created the Invisible Kids Project to connect people advocating for the crisis facing children within the child welfare system. I'll have that linked down below. But in 2022, this case was back in the spotlight because David Carroll was eligible for parole. Now, the board was sent hundreds of letters by the public to deny him, and on September 2nd of 2002, he was denied parole by the board, who said that he lacked insight on the criminal thinking errors and risk factors, and that there is significant community opposition present here. Though he will be eligible for parole in another 10 years, so around 2032. But Liz won't be eligible for parole till 2060, and Amy is free. The chimney used to burn Marcus's body has since been demolished, and it was turned into a memorial for him for several years. So this was later torn down by the landowner, who said that he grew tired of the mourners always coming and leaving litter, which is quite heartbreaking. But do you believe that Amy was more of a mastermind in this case than Liz and David? Was she the one who actually wrapped Marcus up and left him there? Should she have been charged? Anyone who saw Marcus wrapped up like that while he was still alive, while there was time to get him out of that closet should be charged. However, we have been told by David and Liz that Liz wasn't home until Marcus was already deceased. So let me know what you think about that. Was it worth it to dismiss Amy's charges in order to find Marcus's remains? Which story is the truth here? Should Liz be in prison at all? Or any of them telling the truth? Or did something completely different happen? I hate telling these stories of foster parents who become killers or are neglectful or who are just bad people because there are wonderful foster parents out there but there are bad ones too, the ones who just want money or don't really care about the well-being of these children. But we have to look at the bigger systems at hand here because as much as they are at fault for this death, so is the Ohio Child Protective Services. So is Lifeway for Youth or Lifeway of Youth. And their lack of assessment of these people who are handed these children to take care of. It just baffles me that, you know, these people can be sent to prison for this, but there are no repercussions for anyone within CPS. I'm not saying this certain caseworker deserved it because I don't think he had a lot to do with the placement and, you know, there's not a lot caseworkers can do, but the, the higher ups, the ones who are making these decisions on who is placing these kids, who is being accepted as foster parents, no small changes are ever gonna fix that. But don't forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces.